Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining today's webinar, Next Gen DBYD Specification Release. My name is Laura Berman. I'm from Esri Australia's events team and I'll be the host for today's session. The, re sorry, the referral service project is tracking really well. So to get everyone ready for the launch of the next gen referral service in the middle of the year, the team wanted to make sure that you had all the tech details. So joining me today to talk us through everything that we need to know, I have Graham Allen, Operations Manager from DBYD. Graham has been involved in the referral service of the future for many years and is the project manager for the delivery of Next Gen DBYD. Joining him today is Gary Johnson, Chief Innovation Officer of the SmarterWorks portfolio of products. Gary is spearheading the delivery of Next Gen DBYD with our brand new Sentinel solution. So to kick off, I'll hand over to Graham to take us through the next part. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Laura. Thanks for the intro and um, welcome everyone. And thank you um, for joining us as we continue on the journey to deliver the next generation referral service. Doesn't seem that long ago we kicked off, but time is marching on. Um, before we progress to the technical stuff, I, I just want to take the opportunity to give you an update on where we're at. Um, as Smarter Work Sentinel uh, you know, is due to go live on July the 1st. For anyone who hasn't or who isn't familiar with the project, and hopefully there's none of you out there, but maybe there are, um, please go to the Next Gen DBYD website, um, where we have the, the webinar that was held back in August, but also it's been, going to be used for hosting the current specifications and providing future updates um, before we go live in July. This webinar is focused on uh, the asset owning members. Um, so in a, in a rush to get the communications out over the Christmas period, it may have come across in social media that users have registered, and that's okay, you're welcome to stay. However, the content today won't cover the user experience itself. Um, further material and communications covering this topic will be provided over the coming months, obviously, uh, and that will be um, delivered by the team. Um, so, you know, keep your eyes and ears open for that. This uh, webinar, with, along with the specifications, I'm sure Gary will repeat this, will be available on the website, the Next Gen DBYD, and it will be used for as a forum for feedback and, and any questions to support members, you know, because this is a very important period now. You know, everyone's been sort of watching and waiting. And um, well, the time has come to start really getting serious about looking to integrate with the future referral service. I'm pleased to. I'm really pleased to let you know that Gary and his team have been doing some fantastic work. I'm sure I know the CEO is listening in at the moment as well, and we've been, you know, been exposed to some of the really good stuff that they're doing with Smarter Work Sentinel. It is on schedule. Um, preliminary user testing is now in progress, and that's gone out to a stakeholder group. Um, and we're due to actually formally complete that acceptance by the middle of March. So you know everything is on track, and and we're really well on our way to making sure that. This enhanced service is available for our users and members on July the 1st. But the, but the most important part from the members' perspective is that the formal onboarding will begin um, from May. So Gary, if I can get you to click on to the next slide and probably the next one as well, just to... Just, so th this, this was uh, provided uh, in the webinar back in August. Um, obviously, it's been it's been truncated slightly. Um, so right now we're up to obviously the second of February, where this system documentation will be released today, and that does give you a period of time to absorb that from your technical teams and your GIS teams, um, and to communicate and understand what will be required to make sure your service continues seamlessly from July the first. So you have a period of time, but and I'll cover off some more detail coming up as to what that member onboarding will mean for you. Um, obviously, there will be lots of support from the Dial Before You Dig states, who, who you obviously are engaged with, um, and the ASRI Australia team will be supporting that extensively as well. So yeah, as I, 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 there, is, there is a com comprehensive schedule of communications and supporting material is currently being developed. This will support the states, and obviously they will be using this to communicate with members and to keep you aware and to support the, the summary that I'm just about to um, provide you quickly now. Um, but essentially, before the, everything really starts to happen in earnest, from the end of April, a full migration of the data 
that exists in the current service provider will be imported into Smarter Work Sentinel. And this will be the this will be the conduit then for you members to to log in with the service and actually start to test and check and make sure that you can navigate the new portal, etc. And Gary will cover off more on that in the future as well as further trainings made available. Um, but essentially, come the end of April, that migration will happen, and then that onboarding from May will kick in. So, just to provide a short summary of of the key activities. So, essentially, during May um, and members, DB that you members, DB for DIG members will receive um, a, a series of uh, a, a tranche of members, which will be communicated to the states to agree when and who will be onboarded at certain times during May. We don't want everyone coming on at once, um, and we will work with this, uh, any members who have issues with that to make sure that, that the, the, the schedule works for you. But you will receive an email um, to say that you're, you can actually register with the new service to go in and start checking it. Uh, and once you've received that, we'd, we'd want you to go in there and to register your account. Um, states will be um, tracking the progress of this and we will be providing updates to ensure that you know everyone's getting on board and if you have any issues you have the support available to make it happen there will be member training webinars provided in conjunction with the onboarding of each tranche of members um, and further details about that will be communicated in due course but there will be plenty of support provided um, during this period when it's when it's really key that everyone understands what they have to do Dates will follow up with any members who haven't logged on or who are having issues. Um, and, and then really it becomes a case of once you are inside the, the, the Sentinel and you've started to look and you know, navigate uh, way around the portal, it's then just a case of you validating it and running some tests in a sandbox in a sandbox testing area. And that will be provided to ensure that you know you can check your response automation systems, et cetera, and any third party providers who, who deliver that for you. Um, again, everything everything will be well supported um, through May, and then once we get into June, that's when really things will start obviously to get pretty serious. Um, any final um, updates that you may require to your areas of interest, um, you can undertake those then before we go live. Um, and, and then essentially, uh, all being all being good, um, we should be ready to, to to shut down the service for a period of time on June the 30th and. We'll wake up on uh, July the 1st and everything will be sweet and Gary will be a happy gentleman, as, we'll, as we all will be. Gary, I think I'll hand back to you. I think that's uh, enough from me. Thanks, Graham. Thanks for that introduction. Um, yep, so things are tracking along and it's time that we start sharing with you um, the information you need to be able to get ready for that change that's coming later this year. This is a really technical session, and I'm going to race through some of some of the stuff today. But everything I'm going to talk about is already available on the NextGen DBYD website. If you go to nextgendbyd.com.au, you'll find a link for referral specification, and under that, you'll find an um, all of everything we're going to talk about today, much more detail. There's documentation there. There are spec, uh, specs for some of the uh, interchange um, details. And also, shortly after today, you'll find a link to this webinar so you can share it with others that may need to know it. Also on that website, there are some forums where you can ask questions, find out more information, and chat with others about the service as well. So before I go into the actual specifics of um, what's changing in the way that referrals come to you, I want to go through some of the data changes that are coming with the new Dalva 4 dig referral service um, later this year. Because these are going to be important to understand for how you um, use your business rules and how you respond to inquiries. So the first point is that activities will now be a multi-choice where you can specify that on one job, you're doing more than one type of activity. In today's system, each job has exactly one activity type. So it might be manual excavation, but now you'll be able to choose multiple and they will come through to you as a list. The job start can be today and 
that there's no more emergency inquiries. So this idea or concept of emergency inquiry is going away and an asset, uh, an inquirer can, through the Derby3D website, lodge an inquiry where the start date is today. Your obligations to respond remain the same in terms of SLAs and the time that it takes to respond, but you should be aware that inquiries may be lodged where the start date is today. We no longer have the requirement to send out responses by fax or by post. Um, that has gone, no need to, to worry about that anymore. So there'll no longer be the concept of a fax number in the system. Um, the, every inquiry that you get, you will be able to respond to um, electronically, either by email or by calling the new APIs. The relay path for returned responses changes. So um, today, when you get your referral, you create your response. Um, with the email, you send it straight back to the inquirer, uh, to the inquirer's email address. That's changing, and the email address that you will be given is going to be what we call a relay email address, which means you return the response to DBYD, and then DBYD forwards it on to the inquirer. And that allows us to track and maintain the quality of the responses that are going through. So you'll see a change to those email addresses as well. And also, and I know some of you have been asking this question directly recently, um, GDA 2020 will be added as a um, spatial reference system that you can use for um, receiving the, um, the dig sites. So if you've been working to move to GDA 2020 as your projection within your organization, you'll be able to get those referrals coming in in that format as well. Okay, so there are the, some of the high level changes to be aware of. And now I want to go into a little bit more detail about the ways that referrals will come to you and how you might process those. There are three options for referral. What we call legacy email. That's pretty much the same way it works today. Um, webhook, which is where the referral is passed to you as a call to a, a web server at your end. Um, and then the SmarterWorks Automate. So anyone who's using SmarterWorks Automate, given that Style Before You Dig is going to be powered by SmarterWorks Sentinel, it just works. So there's just direct integration between those products. So this is an extract from the documentation that I've just said is available on the nextgendbyd.com.au website. Um, I won't go into the full detail here, but just to point out that with the emails that you receive, if you receive the machine readable email format, so the text body or the XML attachments or the GML attachment, there are some small changes that have been made to accommodate the new data model um, and also some improvements that came out when we were surveying members about changes that they wanted to see. So some of the, quickly through here, so activity description, as I mentioned, is now a list of activities. Um, map type and map ref, so those street atlas grid references are no longer provided. We don't use those anymore. Um, the mobile and fax number fields have been removed. So inquirers now just have one, one phone number. Um, and that email address is a, a return address that takes you through SmarterWorks Sentinel um, rather than directly to the end user. So find more detail about that on the um, website and you'll, um, you'll see all the changes. We've got not just this description, but also the detailed specs of how exactly all of those um, pieces look. There is, as I said, a new option to receive referrals by a webhook, so a call to or an HTTP request to a web service that you may have. So this is all about creating, I guess, more contemporary integration patterns. So that before you did today, integration is by sending files around on emails. Um, that's still going to be available, but the more contemporary solution is direct machine to machine integration using um, HTTP requests. So this will be available through um, Dial Before You Dig. You can choose to set up Webhook. 
where you will enter the URL of wherever your um, web service is, enter a secret key that's used to ensure the um, authenticity of the requests that you receive, and um, then there's no need to worry then about email servers or anything like that. Retry is handled automatically by Spiderbook Sentinel. So if your service is unavailable, if you want to take it down for maintenance, all that sort of thing, then Sentinel will just keep the referrals and send them to you as and when your service is back online again. There's a load of security around the webhooks as well, so that you can um, be sure that they've come from Dial Before You Dig and that there's nothing been changed along the way. And the details of this, again, in all the documentation, but you have options to, um, to use a signing key to um, basically um, have every message that you receive signed in a way that only you can, can determine is correct. And you can add your own headers to the requests that come through. And I know that some people have got firewalls that need that. And you can also whitelist the SmarterWorks IP addresses to be sure they've come from, from Dial Before You Dig. The payload that's received on the webhook referral is a JSON um, um, document, and that JSON is all detailed again on the website. So if you go to nextgendbyd.com.au, you'll find the open API spec version of the webhook referral, which is shown on the screen there, but I'm not going to go into it um, right now. So we've talked about different ways of referrals coming to you. So changes that are going to happen with the information that gets shared with you and changes in the way that that comes through the referral channel of your choice. There's also new ways to respond. So you can still send email responses. That's absolutely fine. Um, the same way you do today. The only change being that the email address you will be given to respond to is a relay address of Dial Before You Dig, and Dial Before You Dig will forward the email on for you. And we do that for many reasons, including allowing us to standardize the subject lines and senders and do um, more work to help standardizing those responses. But also you have an option to directly use the SmarterWorks Sentinel API to send your responses back. This, it, again, avoids you having to deal with email and, and all the costs um, associated with dealing with that. You can just pass all that on to Dell before you dig to deal with. Again, all of this detail is available on the website, but just to give you an overview of using that API, you would first authenticate using an authentication key that you can get through the SmarterWorks Sentinel web application, so through the Dial Before You Dig app. We'll give you the keys that you can use to authenticate, and then you upload your files and submit the response, and that gets packaged up by Dial Before You Dig and set, sent off to the inquirer. It's all a REST API, um, it's all using sort of standard um, uh, formats for that. So just before we um, get to questions, I just wanted to talk about one other change that's uh, that's coming, and that's to do with the way that inquiry splitting um, works in SpiderWorks Sentinel. So you can choose as an asset owner to say that I don't want to receive any referrals where the job site is bigger than a certain size in square kilometers or square meters, and where an inquirer does lodge an inquiry larger than that, it will be split up for you and sent as various different parts so that you can respond to each of those smaller um, referrals. Now, the, the way that the splitting works in today's service is it sort of works on a grid system and it can lead to breaking up an inquiry into many more parts than is required. And this example on the screen here shows how an inquiry was split in today's system, where it was broken into nine parts, and each of those parts is very different in size. You can see some really small slivers there and some larger ones. 
with the new system, we will endeavor to try and create each of those parts as roughly the same size and also not break it up unnecessarily into more than is required by your maximum size. Now, the reason this is important to think about is that you may have a max maximum size set today of 10 square kilometers. In today's system, your referrals will be split up much smaller than that. So you may see that you maximum that you receive it ever is like six square kilometers. So you might need to consider reducing down the maximum inquiry size if that's going to be a problem for you. And just because we're going to honor those values um, much more strictly than happens in, in today's system. So as I say, all this information is available on the NextGen DBYD website. In today's session, we just wanted to introduce you to that, make you aware of some of the changes and give you the tools that you need to be able to further investigate, to understand the changes that might apply to you in the way that you manage your business rules and the systems that you use. I also want to leave time today to ask questions and we'll get to that um, very shortly. On the NextGen DBYD website, there are some forums where you can also go to ask questions. So I created a new forum in there for referral specification where you can ask your questions and we'll um, get back to you on those. Today's webinar is also going to get added to that site. And any questions that are asked today, we'll also um, make sure that we provide answers to those through that website. So that brings us to the and question section. So over to you, Laura. Thanks, Gary, and thanks, Graham. So we've had lots of questions that are, have been coming through. So I'll just jump straight into it. Um, we've got a question that's come through from Anthony um, asking about, so once this all goes live, um, will the URL go back to 1100.com.au? Um, yes. yes, so the, um, sorry, Graham. So, the, the next gen DBYD site is there temporarily for now. Um, the main website will be the main 1100.com.au website. Any bookmarks that you have to the existing one call solution will need to be changed then. So um, the, the new site will have a slightly different URL that you might need to update. Okay, great. Um, next question came through from Eve asking, so we have customers wanting um, to post responses, how do we deal with that through this system if no longer available? Yep. So every inquiry that will be lodged in the new system will have an email address to allow that response to be sent back. So the idea of people being able to lodge inquiries through the call center is, is now gone. So inquiries can only be lodged online. And that's why you no longer need to worry about those those return paths. Now, if somebody comes to you specifically saying that um, they want you to send them to them, you will have a postal address for the uh, inquirer. But you know, everything's about trying to discourage that as a path and move people onto email. I don't know, Graham, okay, you yeah, no, I, I endorse that, Gary. That's exactly what, what we're looking for. Um, and I guess if there are any issues, then you know the, the states. Um, uh, sorry, the, the help desk or support desk can be, um, you know, reached out to, to to seek some support in due course. Well, that we sounds we really definitely want to, we, we definitely want to get to a, a path where everything's online and via email, correct? That's great. I've actually had a couple of questions that have come through around that same topic and wanting to be able to continue via email. So it sounds like the system does that. So that's really good. Um, I have another question from Chi that's come in. Um, is there an end time period for retry or will it keep trying until it's successful? Um, yes, yeah, so for the, the webhook, it will try for a maximum of 12 attempts using a sort of an exponential back off, which means that it will try over a period of about six to eight hours. It's random. And so after 12 attempts over six to eight hours, it will fail and you'll be notified that there's a problem and you're then able to um, go in and release those manually for anything that was 
has been stopped because it was it just failed for more than six hours or so. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another one that came through from Chi Graham. This one might be for you. Um, can members start testing the system instead of waiting until May? Um, to just um, wanted to be clear from the presentation if they can test earlier uh, ahead of any you know, the preliminary or formal testing mentioned. I think they will. My, my, no, that, that's not the case. The, the system from a member's perspective will be made effectively available from the beginning of May for that formal testing. Gary, you might want to endorse that, but that's um, essentially all of the up, up, you know, leading up to now to the, you know, to effectively the first of May is all about these sorts of questions uh, and, and to allow any support required. But the, the onboarding will commence from beginning of May and testing will start during that period as well. Okay, great. Um, we've got a question that's come through from John asking, what is the logic behind accepting inquiries on the day of proposed works? Yeah, I, might, the, I guess the, 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 you know, there's obviously a bit of a history behind um, the, the two-day period in the past. But, I, I, you know, the, 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 there are so many instances now where the vast majority of responses are received within a fairly short period of time. And, this, and the service will advise users in the future as to the anticipated wait times. But, you know, that legacy of the two days goes back to a time when, you know, things were faxed or were posted in terms of responses. And the, and the use of the emergency um, you know, inquiry as well became pretty much redundant. You know, we're not we're not there for an emergency service. If there are if there is an emergency, you need to treat it as such, and you know, do what you re required with the emergency services. Um, so the the move really is the the onus is still on the users and the inquirers, sorry, to make sure that they receive all of the material before they start. So you know, even if they say they're going to start it on the day, if they don't receive everything, then they really need to make sure that they do because they're that's their obligation, and the confirmation sheet makes that clear. So it doesn't it doesn't change the onus. It just changes the fact that you can you know initiate the fact that you're starting that job on the day. Um, that that's really the it's, it's a fundamentally no difference because in the past you, you know anyone can start a job whenever they want. That, that's their they take that at their own risk. We're saying that you need to wait for all of the right information to be received, including all the all the responses that you're expecting to receive, be that five, six, or seven of them. So whether you have to wait a day for it. Well, you could, then that's when the, the inquirer needs to start following up with the asset owner if, say, they have lapsed past their expected, expected response time. The onus is always on the user to make sure they have the information basic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Charles has asked, um, will we still be provided with customer contact details? So, for example, mobile phone number in case we want to chase up with the customer regarding job details? Yes, is the answer. Yeah, and you get the you get a phone number, a, a postal or street address, and um, obviously the ability to email them as well. Great, and that's good because um, Bruce also um, asked around the customer email address, so that sounds like it's a yes for that one as well. Um, just make sure I've got this full question. Um, so uh, a question from Anthony, just asking if, there, if the system is already automated, will there be many changes required? Um, I, I guess it depends what automated solution you have. Um, and so, um, you know, de depending on the supplier that you work with, um, you know, they'll be doing the, the work necessary to, to keep it working for you. Um, if you're using the SmarterWorks Automate product, then there's no changes required. Um, that's all going to be integrated. Okay, great. Um, a question came through from Philip. We've recently started using Esri's SmarterWorks Automate for doing our responses. Is there anything that we will need to do? Um, no, really. I mean, um, we'll make sure that all those products work together. Um, if you have business rules around activity types, um, we will be reaching out to you just to confirm how those business rules work um, because obviously we're moving from one job having one activity type to one job having many activity types. But you'll be reached out to um, through the Smarter Work support team to um, just verify any changes to those rules. Okay. Um, a question that came through from Michael. Um, in some situations, 
we need to provide a spotter? Can we set it so that we are not able to accept inquiries where the dig is on the current day? So, so the answer to that's that's no. Um, and I just want to make a point on this that Dar before you dig doesn't police when people are doing work. Um, there are safe work practices that say that you shouldn't start work until you have all the information necessary or that you've communicated with the utilities that are involved. So all of that stays exactly the same. The only change that's happening is that somebody can insert a date in a field on the website that is today's date. It doesn't change their obligations about when they work or when it's safe to start work or anything like that. It's, it's literally all it's saying is some people do start work same day and they can, they can communicate that to you, but it doesn't change um, anything else around the process of um, response or the, or the safe work practices that they follow. You know, with DWID is the first step and all the other steps still remain in place regardless of what date they entered in the field on the website. Yeah, I fully endorse that, Gary. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, a question from Tim. Will there be any facility to pull the referrals in batches during a processing window rather than receiving them singly through a webhook? Yeah, interesting question. So um, there is going to be a published API for Smarter Work Sentinel. And that would mean that if you chose to, Tim, you could develop your own system to poll for the, you know, poll the table, poll the APIs for any referrals that have been received. So um, we're making sure that is a, a published API around all aspects of the product, including being able to query for referrals and things like that. So technically, uh, Tim, you could build that approach to um, polling rather than um, waiting to, for them to be pushed to you. Um, and that documentation around the API will be released um, later. Okay, great. Um, a question from John. Is there any logic um, to stop multiple requests from the same user for the same location? So if there's an issue with the data, the end user is presented with an alternative message? Um, uh, no, um, it's not something we've been asked about previously. Uh, Graham, I don't know whether you have... No, uh, sorry, what, what's it? The, the multiple inquiries from the same so what was say again please sure, sure. stop multiple requests from the same user for the same location um that's hmm, no that's no hmm. um john i was thinking you about that separately yeah one. and i was thinking on the um on the next gen um website you've got um an option for to send through ideas i think so that might be something for john ideas, absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah, go into a bit more detail. Um, okay, moving on. So um, a question from Lee, is the start date time stamped? Um, the start date is a date only field. So the inquiry is time stamped, um, but the start date is just a date. So effectively, you're saying that if somebody says I'm going to make an inquiry at 9 p.m. at night and I'm doing it on the same day, that doesn't give them much of a wind to do the work. But if I'm making the inquiry at 6 o'clock in the morning, that's quite logical. I guess that's the rationale behind the question. I'm not sure. Yeah, so a part of this was, and the reason it was requested, was that there are times when people do have to start work today, uh, like emergency repairs and things, they will still go through and do everything they need to do to collect the information that they've got. But they want to have a DBYD inquiry confirmation sheet that says that they put the job start date as today. They entered the correct date and the existing system was causing people to put tomorrow's date, even if they were starting today. So that's, that's part of it. I think there was also some legal ramifications around insurance on that as well. It's got a bit of a legacy behind it. So, uh, Lee, um, your follow-up around that about if they started yeah. work at 7 a.m. but didn't make their inquiry till 4 p.m. Again, you know, DWID is not policing this process. It's providing the information to help with safe 
excavation. Yeah, you're clearly doing that at your own risk if you're doing something like that. That's at the, the digger's risk. Yep. Okay, great. Um, a question through from Scott. Um, is there a requirement for all communications with referrers to go via DBYD, or is it only the referral response that is required to go back through DARBA4UD? So DARBA4UD wants to be able to, um, uh, I guess, investigate the quality of responses and the timeliness of responses and all that side of things. They're not interested in the follow-up communication. It's, is the referral that's been issued to you, has that been responded to um, with a quality response in a timely manner. Um, that's that's the interest. So it's it's only that initial response really that uh, DBYD is interested in. Um, you can still use that relay address for further communication if you want to, uh, but really it's that that, that initial response that um, trying to look out for quality and standards and so on. Okay, um, Kristen has sent through um, a two-part message. I think it's all together. So. Um, what monitoring do you have for utility responses that are forwarded by DBYD? So, i.e. any risk that response not forwarded due to some sort of system failure? So, every um, response that gets issued, we track that from um, leaving us to it being confirmed as delivered by the email services. We see that it's been opened and we can even see if it's been clicked on within the email as well. So anything that gets bounced um, or delayed, we track that. Um, and so we've got that full audit trail of whether things were delivered or not. And that information um, can also be um, queried through the application to understand the, the state of those responses. Okay, and I think we had another a similar question come through from Ben Catram, and I think that's um, the same question around res not processing, getting an error, and what information do you have? So it sounds like there's reporting in there that will let you see that. Yeah, and and every every transaction is treated separately, so you know, a failure in one transaction doesn't impact you know future transactions. Great. Uh, Linda has asked, um, will there be a way for same-day referrals to be prioritised for response? Um, so th this would be something for you um, as the member. So DBYD is going to pass through all the referrals. Um, now, if you on your end want to prioritise them, then all that information is there about the, the job start date and everything so that you could use that within your response automation system or your internal business process. Um, but DBYD will just keep pushing those referrals through as they get as they get raised. Okay. Um, Neil has sent through a question. Um, if multiple activities can be entered on one request by an inquirer, will the asset owner be charged once or for each activity? Graham, did you want to tell? No, it's it's no, it's it, it's just it's the same as it was in the past. It's just a referral. It's the same. It's just providing more information for each um, inquiry, basically, allowing um, excavators to make maybe they're doing two or three things um, on the same job site. And it provides more information, obviously, to the asset owner to perhaps allow them to manage the business rules accordingly. It's, it, it's quite a popular request as well from, from users and members, but no, no, no difference in charging. Okay, great. Um... I've got a question through from Pat. Um, is there a test environment we can use to make sure we've implemented the changes correctly? Yes, yeah, so from the first or from, from from May, when you get invited to start using the system, so you'll have you know May and June as as your testing period. And um, so SmartWorks Sentinel includes a testing mode. So once you've configured the connection between um, Sentinel and your response system or your email or whatever, and you can do test inquiries through that. Um, you sort of lodge an inquiry and it just comes to your, your referral channel. So you get, um, you, you can do whatever inquiry you like, any fields, anywhere, and it will, they'll be sent to you as, as test referrals. Okay, great. 
Um, Thomas has asked, will, will we be able to get a summary of inquiries that have been responded to? Yeah, so um, what, one of the, the, the new things in the next gen DVYD is ref, a whole reporting suite for asset owners. So you can run reports on um, the referrals you've received and responses that have been sent back and um, all of the um, you know, broken down in different ways by activity type and dates and all of that. So, yep, there's a whole reporting piece um, that's inside of SmarterWorks Sentinel that you'll get access to. Okay, great. Um, and a question from Paul. Um, for a basic email response, do we as the member simply reply to the email received from DBYD or does the reply email address still need to be sourced from within the email body? That's a great question, Paul, um, and something that I will come back to you on. So, um, and the reason I want to come back to you on it is because I think it's a really interesting idea and something that we want to look at. So at the moment, we haven't implemented it that way. Um, you need to find the email address in the body to respond to, but I like the idea. And so let us take a look at it. And through the next NDBYD website, we'll come back with a fuller response on that. Thanks for, the, thanks for raising that idea. Nice one. Okay, cool. excellent. And thanks from Paul there, so that's great. Um, okay, we've got time for probably um, one more question. Um, so just back to the, to the rollout, so Gina just asked, uh, you mentioned the rollout stage, are we able to choose when we participate? So the specific days, that type of thing. Uh, Oh, I mean, we'll be, we'll be communicating via the states with the members. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, once once that communications are, are happening and they will, you know, start to happen fairly quickly when we've, you know, had those you know discussions with the state members and with the members, I'm quite sure that we can work through any um, specific requirements. But obviously there's going to be a limit to that. We, we need to get everyone on board and ready. So, you know, We'll, we'll need to be quite strict in some instances to make sure everyone's accommodated, but I'm sure we'll be able to um, work around any individual issues as best we can. But there are a lot of members. There's a there's a lot of people to a lot of members to come on board, small to to very big, um, and it's not a, you know it's a two month window, so there won't be so much latitude, I guess. Okay. Uh, well, thank you both. Lots of um, great questions. So. Um, as you both mentioned, um, this session has been recorded and will be um, available, um, a recording of this webinar will be available up on 1100.com.au within the next few days. Um, you can share your ideas. So we had a couple of ideas come up through the webinar. Um, so you can share your ideas at nextgendbyd.com.au. Um, and just lastly, all the questions um, that have come through today will actually be collated into a Q&A, which will be uploaded to, um, Gary, I believe it's the next Gen DBYD site. That's, that's right. I don't know if Gary's responded, but yeah, that's where they'll be put. That's where they were put for the August webinar, and that's Excellent. where it will be for this webinar. Okay. Um, Thanks, Graham. Um, so thank you both, and thanks everyone um, for join it, joining us. Um, and make sure to head to nextgendbyd.com.au to see for any additional information or share your ideas.